and let's spend some time talking about primes. So we have numbers. However, we choose a figure, any sort of figure representation, base 10, Roman, Egyptian. We have numbers themselves. The idea of a one is unique. It stands all by itself. It's just it's the idea of this is divisible, right? It's just one. How can you share? Uh, it's just one. There isn't even a concept of sharing. It just is. We can start to break things apart only when we have more than one. That's when people ask, is one a prime? That doesn't make sense. It's just one. The idea of prime is the idea of you know share, not being shareable, right? That only happens when I got more than one. That's when I can start breaking them apart. So two is where we first start off on this. And this idea of primes says the number must be greater than or equal to two. And P has only one and P has factors. So if we're talking about sharing, this is always true. All for one and one for all is all for true. If that's the only thing you've got it's prime. So two would be a prime. Three would be a prime. Four would be not a prime, right? If I would look at that, I would say, well, wait a second. Four can be broken up into two groups of two. Five, that would be a prime. Six, that's not a prime. That's two groups of three or three groups of two. Seven, all right, that's a prime. Well, so far I noticed that there's an awful lot, there's more primes than things that are not prime, right? The Four is a composite, six is a composite, one is not something we even think about. And then on to eight, this is a composite. I could break it up into two groups of four. Oops, missing. All right, nine. That's a composite. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, etc. And so those are composites. And if I wanted to define a composite, you know, obviously you can say, well, it means not prime. But what would it mean to be not prime? What it would mean to be not prime is if prime it says the only factors are 1 and P, not that is I've got something else, right? Something that's not 1 and P divides it. So what this is really saying is C greater than or equal to 2 is composite if A, which is greater than or equal to 2, yet less than or equal to C minus 1. If it's not 1 and it's not C, it's in between. So it's either 2, which is just bigger than 1, or C minus 1, just less than C. If it exists such that A divides C. Well, really all I'm saying is, is that it has something that divides it that's not 1 and it's not C. So for an example, 12, 12 is composite because there's something that's not 1 and 12 that divides it. Now, it has a lot. It has 2, 3, 4, 6. Right? It has these things that are not 12 that divides it, but I just need at least 1. Now, on the other hand, because of the definition of divisibility, if you have one number that's between A, but that's between 2 and C minus 1 that divides it, you actually have 2, right? Because what is the definition of divisibility? There exists an integer such that the number times an int is that. And you could simply say, well, well, that means that A times K is C, but that would mean that, well, K is also a factor, right? And that would also be between 2 and C minus 1. But really, just say 1. It's enough. So that's the difference between primes and composites. How do we find such things? Um, when we're looking for them, and why is this kind of an interesting feature, this creates the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. Now the proof of this, we don't have nearly enough stuff to actually prove this. Uh, you'll have the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, which is stated in the book. And the proof of it is broken across later chapters and later pages. And the fundamental theorem of arithmetic simply says 
for all integers n greater than or equal to 2, n can be written as a unique product of primes in non-decreasing order. Uh, note. The so number three is three, which is this is this would be a product of one prime. Whereas on the other hand, if I had something like say twelve, which is equal to two squared times three, okay, that's more classic. When you think of product, you normally think of I have a lot of them. But if I define product as simply being one, it's all by itself, right? Well, what is it producting? Nothing. It's just by itself. If I define that as a product, we're okay. So what we're doing here is every, every number that we have has at its heart a prime skeleton structure. So if we would look at the numbers and we would say, okay, I have the numbers 1, which is all by itself. It's not a prime. It's not a composite. It's just 1. And we got 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, et cetera. What I could actually do is every one of these numbers All numbers are on their inside a unique representation of a product of primes. Why do I have to say non-decreasing order? 2 times 3 is 3 times 2, right? Since we have associativity and commutativity, could you say, well, I have different ways of multiplying. I could say 2 times 3 is 3 times 2. It's like, yeah, that's the same thing. So if I tell you the order, write it going up. There's only one way to do it. So what's interesting is all numbers now from going from 1 is unique, it stands off, of, but from here on out, from 2 to infinity, everybody is either a prime or it has this unique prime signature. There's no other way to get 12 besides 2 times 2 times 3. That's his skeletal structure and that's what makes up 12. So what matters is the primes. The proof of, of such thing has to do two things. One, you would have to prove if I would want to prove this particular theorem, there's two things that we have to work with. One is, if you have a product of primes, it must be unique. That 2 times 2 times 3 is the only way that I could ever multiply primes to get 12. And the other one would be existence. That they are, there are actually, whatever number you pick, it's either prime or a product of primes. Right? And you would have to prove that. To prove existence, you would, you're, we're going to need another technique later on. We're going to need induction. But uniqueness does not require induction. Uniqueness we could actually prove here in a little bit, but we need a couple lemmas to be able to get to that point. So it's kind of interesting that the heart of all numbers is primes. So everybody has this nice prime skeletal structure, no matter what number you pick. So primes are the things that are actually interesting about integers either prime or composite. Now, um, how do we find them? Uh, finding primes, the first one, or prime factorization. How do we do prime factorizations? Um, the first is a nice little theorem can help us which is if n is composite, then there is a prime of some sort, let's just simply call it p, such that p divides the number and 
p is less than or equal to the square root of n. So if I want to look for prime factorization, so if I take any sort of number, say 12, 12, and I say find all the prime factors, all right, what's the square root of 9? 3. Uh, what's the square root of 16? 4, right? So 12, if I took its square root, is somewhere between, a pure square root would be somewhere between what? 3 and 4. So this is saying that if it does have prime factors, what are the only ones I need to look for? Numbers less than its square root. So where do I need to look? What are the only primes less than the square root of 12? 2 and 3. That's it. That's all you have to look for. You're guaranteed that. Just look to the square root, and those are the only ones I need to check. So I just need to check by this theorem. All I need to do is check 2 and 3. Well, does 2 divide 12? Yeah. 12 is equal to 2 times 6. Now I do 6. What are the only things? What's the square root of 6? two point something. So what's the only number I need to start looking for? Two. It must have somewhere between it, and so there's a, there's a two there. There's another two, and so I get two squared times three. What would that tell us for a harder problem, like 101? Primer composite. Well, I have to check. I have to factor it, right? What are the only, what's the square root of 101 about? 10. So that means that if it has a prime factor, right, if a prime factor exists and everybody is either prime or has prime factors, what are the only primes I need to check? What are the primes less than 10? 2, 3, 5, 7. That's it. I only need to check four primes. Well, what about everybody else? I don't have to. I only need to look up to the square root. Right, composite says, we'll check everybody. Well, I don't need to check that. This theorem says, just look for prime factors. Because everybody, if it has factors, it has to be a bunch of primes. Which ones do I need to look for? Right? One's up to the square root. Does 2 divide it? 2 does not divide 101. Why not? Things that, divide, things that are divisible by 2, things that are even, end in what? Zero. Two, four. Why? Why is it the only thing that matters the last number? Why not the rest of it makes it even? Why is it just the last number? Do, 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 do. It's base 10. This is 2 times 100 plus 10 plus 1. What is 100 congruent to when you divide it by 2? Zero. What's 10 divided by 2? Zero. What's the only thing that matters? The last number. Right? Because everybody else is congruent to zero when I divide by two. Because I'm looking at mod two. All right, so two doesn't divide it. Does three divide 101? Everybody say no. What's the rule for divisibility by three? The digits have to add to three. Well, why would that happen? Why do the digits have to add to three? Well, if I had a... B, C in a positional number in base 10, what does that really mean? It's A times 100 plus B times 10 plus C, right? That's what that really means. If I divide by 3, what's 100 mod 3? It's 1. What's 10 mod 3? 1. So these are actually 1s. So what's left? A plus B plus C. If it doesn't divide A plus B plus C, it cannot divide it because all the other stuff is just a bunch of ones. That's why we have these rules. These rules are the things that you learn for divisibility are modular arithmetic. All these rules simply come from modular arithmetic. So guess what? 3 doesn't divide 101. Why? Because they don't, well, why is that true? Okay, what's the next prime I have to check? 5. Does 5 divide 101? No. Why? 
base 10, we have the zeros. The, the, the last number needs to be a what? Zero or a five. Now, the, now comes one you would probably want to check because I don't think anybody knows this one. So the 101, is it divisible by seven? Well, let's do the long way. Does seven go into 10? Does seven go into 31? Nope. So guess what? What's 101? It's prime. By checking only four primes, I proved that it's prime. This also gives us the ability, this theorem makes it great for prime factorization. I could give you really large numbers, and all you have to do is check up to the square root. 